Hi, everyone. Welcome to our roundtable discussion on the current challenges in open source software development in the fields of biology and neuroscience. And we are very excited to have Adina Wagner, Caleb Kibet, Shoshra Falkenstein, and Hao Ting Wang as guests for this discussion. So Adin is a doctoral researcher at the INM7 at the Hulich Research Center in Germany. Caleb is currently a bio bioinformatician at the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology in Kenya. Joshua is an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at John Hopkins University in the United States. And Hao is a postdoc fellow at University of Sussex and Brighton in the UK. So uh, before starting a few words about the format of this session, first our presenters will give us a brief overview of themselves and the work they have been doing. And then we will open up a round of Q and A's. And we have some questions prepared, but we also welcome questions from the audience. So please use the Q and A section of Ermi to raise any questions you may have for our guests. So Adina, you want to go ahead and share your presentation? Uh, yes, I will. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, um, my name is Adina, and I thought as a, a quick uh, introduction, I thought I'd talk about the path that I had as a neuroscientist into open source. Um, I work at the Institute for Neuroscience and Medicine in Jülich, um, and I think um, that the path to open source that I had is exemplifying of one way uh, in which this diverse field of neuroscience and biology gets its user, contributor, or, or maintainer base. Um, so by training, like many neuroscientists, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist. I, I have worked with kids, with COVID, with patients, um, but during my studies, I never worked on software or much with computers. I was an absolute noob. <clears throat> but I was interested in the field of neuroimaging, which is a field with a strong computational component. And I joined, hence a lab with strong programming background for my final project during my studies and thought, okay, how bad can it really get? And then um, something happened that plenty of neuroscientists are probably familiar with. Um, for the analysis that I wanted to do, I needed to use a MATLAB toolbox. Now, luckily, the people that I, I worked with were super strong proponents of open source. And also, luckily, I was absolutely naive because they told me that it would be a great exercise for me and way to learn Python programming that I could port this MATLAB toolbox into Python. And I, I believed them and, and I tried to tackle this, this project. And uh, it was absolutely infuriating <laughs> and frustrating. In hindsight, a great learning opportunity. Um, and I, it felt like I made every possible mistake that there was. But, but with the help of, of um, mentors, of, of other people, open source tutorials, um, I actually, I can't still believe it, uh, managed to package it up. Write, write tests for it, have a Python package. Um, and uh, there even was a journal where I could turn this into an academic publication so that as a scientist, I could uh, contribute something to my CV. But what was really striking to me was that suddenly a couple of people were using this. It was an absolute niche software. Um, and uh, suddenly people started to, to create issues and then people, created pull requests and, and improved it. It was absolutely, absolutely amazing. And some people even cited it in their scientific work. So there was an absolutely gratifying experience. And then with further help of, of mentors and, and um, supervisors, I, I managed to build up the courage to engage a little bit more, ask questions, issues, maybe even submit a PR. And with the help of a lot of friendly maintainers in neuroscience, I also grew in confidence and, and I managed to extend my skills. And I was able to continue with this kind of open source work by contributing, sharing, packaging up the sciencey stuff that I did further. So when I then started my PhD, I did that in a lab that were the creators or um, maintainers of the software data lab, um, which is a software that is unrelated to my PhD project, but I wanted to contribute because it, it grew on me. I, 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 was, I was a fan of open source and I wasn't in a, an, an environment that encouraged me to contribute. But the problem was that this code base of this project was so large 
And I had never seen something like this before. I could only program Python code that looked like MATLAB code, um, that I was completely overwhelmed. I did not know how I should be able to contribute. But there was one way I found myself to be useful uh, because nobody um, in the scientific user base was able to use DataLed. Uh, only a few people were because the documentation of this tool was geared towards developers. So what I did was that I started a community project um, that created a handbook with really extensive documentation for this. And this project is already two years old now. It was amazing. So many people joined and helped. Uh, so many contributors. Um, we get academic citations and I got an understanding of the source code. I got an understanding of user issues. I got what was able to meaningfully contribute. And uh, that was that was that was really, really fantastic. So uh, for me, neuroscience is really worthwhile with this with this large and growing amount of open source software and the active inclusive community that helps me learn. Um, obviously, I realized that I'm really lucky to be in such an encouraging environment. And I think we will discuss this also later. So what I really hope for is that we can make it easier for others to have uh, positive experiences with open source too in any role, user, contributor, maintainer, and to by this further the adoption and contribution of open source in our fields. Thanks. That was great, Adina. Thank you so much. Um, so our next presenter would be Caleb. Do you want to present? Hi, uh, so uh, my name is Caleb, I'll, I hope you can see my slides. So I'll be talking about leaving no one behind uh, when it comes to the space of open source and also the space of uh, open science as a well. whole. So that's who I am, I'm a bioinformatician and what I want to highlight here is that I'm a hiker and a trail mapper and I just want to use the concept of hiking and trail mapping to just I write some of the ways you can ease the pathway towards uh, adopting open science or being able to contribute to open source. And these are some of the questions that I reflect about and generally what open science means for us, especially as African researchers or academic institutions. And really, how can we ease the adoption of open science practices uh, within these spaces? And how can we control the narrative, develop, develop policies, and really adapt to work that is that works for our setting uh, based on where we are. Having the understanding that really an article is just an advertisement and what is important is a full software environment which includes the data and the code. And so the code being the scholarship, there is need for that adoption of those practices in all regions by everyone, by all scientists to be able to benefit on uh, the, the advantages of this. But then there's this aspect of you cannot be an efficient scientist and especially being able to collaborate efficiently until your collaborators are also equipped and aware of the tool that you want to use. And so I uh, built a community called Open Science Key, which equipped uh, researchers on open science tools and just aims to ease the adoption of these tools within their research. And we use the model of just being able to sensitize, train, then hack, collaborate, and build a community. And the, the premise here is there is need for awareness before someone can use anything. And then having been with awareness, then they need this need for empowerment, for training, and then ultimately uh, be, being part of a community that uh, does that. And we uh, participate in the eLife Sprint and we build a for uh, and low cost open access, uh, which helps students and researchers being able to determine where they can publish at low cost, especially being able to adopt uh, some of the open access practices. So leaving no one behind, what are some of the lessons that you can learn from hiking and trail mapping? I, I map trails and create paths that people can uh, follow. And what are some of the things that we get to understand there? Uh, there's a need to hike the small hills first before you can climb the mountains and that would prepare you for the mountains. So that's really important for those who are interested in joining uh, the open source uh, platform or just being able to contribute. Uh, be open by design and not by default. And really when it comes to hiking, just being able to openly encourage others to uh, to fall and just having a plan when it comes to trail mapping, just not going uh, without a plan and 
having created that pathway, others can come and follow that pathway. So the concept here is being a trail mapper, create pathways for others to follow towards the summit where there's a beautiful view. Let all en enjoy that view that you're also enjoying at the top. And in the end, of course, there's the need for inclusivity. Uh, the barriers and challenges exist, and especially when it comes to hiking and uh, climbing mountains. There's so many barriers, there are hills and those rocks. Uh, but if we work together, we can and support each other. We can all get to the mountain and we can all enjoy uh, the view. And these are just some of uh, the acknowledgements that I have. So thank you so much. Thank you, Caleb. I love the analogy of hiking. So how do you want to... Yes. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hao Ting Wang, and today just uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I became a contributor uh, in the uh, past two years' time. So a little bit background about me. I am a cognitive neuroscientist in by training. I think we lost you, how, or is it only me? Uh, are we back again? <laughs> yeah, I think now now we can hear you. Could you okay. start like again? This yes, way? I will. I'm so sorry about this. No, it's Hi. okay. No worries. Yeah, it happens. Well, oopsie. <laughs> Right, now that should work. Okay, yeah, I'll restart. Um, yeah, so my name is Hao Ting Wang and I'll talk a little bit about my journey from a user to a contributor to open source project. Um, I may, I have a PhD in cognitive neuroscience and that is my uh, training background. And now I am a postdoc research fellow at Brighton Sussex Medical School. And my research topic mostly focused on fMRI, functional connectivity, and multivariate analyses to understand how brain and behavior correlate with each other. And so far, I have contributed to a few um, Python-based uh, neuroimaging libraries, including Nyla, Nybabel, and Pydra. Yeah. And I go to this event a lot called Brain hack. It is where that motivates me to be part of this uh, open source community. And when I was like a user and consumer of software, like my first interaction with open science was uh, sharing code for a research paper I, I published and share preprint of the research paper and share some like metadata summary data of my neuroimaging analyses. So that's what my, my PhD lab tells me to do. Um, so that's like kind of the first taste of working openly for me. And there are some challenges with like my research topic. So for example, multivariate methods a lot of time requires a good sample to feature ratio. That means I will need to do, I will need to have a lot of samples if I want to uh, have a really rich um, representation of my um, feature space. And neuroimaging data, as you know, is like there are a lot of voxels and for functional connectivity matrix, you will get a, a lot of features. So I want to just like have a better measure to improve this kind of measure and in my research. So that got me to uh, start thinking, okay, so what is the best kind of way to represent some imaging data? So that led to my first PR. So I want to, uh, so um, if you do analysis in the native space of neuroimaging data, it, it's a lot of things that you don't need. 
Uh, so I discovered, oh, there's a way to map data to a smaller amount of space using a surface imaging format. And at that point, there was not that many tools to um, do the manipulation of surface data. Most of the tools are developed on volumetric data. And the existing software library didn't really support an easy method to interact with surface data. So at about the same time, I went to a summer school and met the dev of the Nightbabel library dealing with imaging uh, input and output. And he helped me start with my first PR. So literally, this is the first time I encounter a proper um, a software development related process. I learned to write tests, learned how to use Git properly through this one PR. And I learned a few things. So first thing is people are really nice out there. It's like no one will say, oh, don't contribute to this because you're useless. People are really, really willing to help you. And another thing I realized is you there's a lot of bots on GitHub and metrics to help you improve your code quality like uh, style guides is like that's something I never thought about and and also uh, this is the first time I learned how to use branches and merge in git to realize oh what is the relationship between git and like a full development process so after that I kind of spent one year of time just to you adapt that kind of method to on my own projects and learn some software writing practice and I continue to practice um, so now I would say I will, if I'm a user of software, I'll try to approach the devs and uh, give them questions if I have a question. Um, so I start joining my uh, code sprint to meet other people. And, um, and sometimes if I cannot understand the documentation, I'll still ask a question um, just to yeah, interact with them. And sometimes it will help you to read the doc uh, faster than you do it on your own. And I try to intentionally include any kinds of open source work as part of my job. And I contribute to more projects other than just you know, uh, Nightbabble now. Now I'm also contributing to Nylon and uh, Pydra, something that is not directly related to neuroimaging, but a data workflow framework. And I made a lot of friends along the way. And I guess that's the most important part for me. So right now, I'll consider the challenges I'm facing is how am I going to survive as someone who's so passionate about software, but staying in academia at the same time. And second thing is, uh, I know a lot of people come from similar places as me who don't have any kinds of training in this. What would be the useful way to help them to take part in um, contributing to open source software? Yeah. So. Yeah, that is my talk. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Hao. Very interesting. So I think uh, Joshua could not be with us today, uh, but Sambit, who is a student in his lab, would uh, present. I think you're muted some bit. Oh, so yeah, so my PI, like uh, like Martina mentioned, was uh, Joshua Vogelstein. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here. Uh, our lab has a real commitment to open source and open access. And I thought I'd uh, talk about some of the principles that we use whenever we create packages, open source packages. Um, and just like the steps we follow and ensure that all of our packages have uh, this. So I guess I can talk about my background. This is his background. Uh, my background is um, I went to North Carolina State University. Uh, I didn't do all, any open access, open source things at all. Uh, but then when I joined our lab, uh, it's called Neurodata. I enjoyed it. <laughs> So um, 
I started contributing to a lot of open source packages uh, early on and created a few. Uh, so let's talk about that. So whenever we're developing our packages, we follow this acronym for so our code should be findable, installable, run, runnable, and modifiable. So first, I'll talk about what findable means. Basically, that means just have it on some kind of open source code repository. Uh, so that includes something like GitHub or GitLab. Um, we sometimes generate a permanent digital uh, identifier, not always uh, using something like Zenodo. Um, and then we had a license. Um, this is really important because uh, that's the first thing that people check whenever they want to use your code in another code base. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of you know this website. Uh, whenever choosing a, a license, this is a great one to use. Um, next, our code should be installable. So usually that means like a one-line installation instruction uh, thing. So that includes like pip install, blah, or conda uh, install. And so, yeah, so like I mentioned, we use PyP a lot for our Python code. Most of our code is in Python. Some of our code is in R, so we use CRAN for that. Uh, also, we sometimes provide a container uh, for a package that helps the user uh, just have a set environment for them to run their code. Uh, so Docker is in Singularity or ones you may have heard of. Uh, Gigantum is one that our lab actually helped create. It's more of a uh, online Docker container. So you can run your code uh, through there. Through, like tutorials and stuff can be run through there a lot easier. Uh, next, uh, runnable. So uh, code should always have a demo uh, that's fast and easy to run. And that's really what users actually will most likely use. Oh, like, well, whenever they come to your code and they want to run an algorithm, they'll most likely go to a demo first. So demos are extremely important, I think. Um, so we generally use R Markdown, Jupyter Notebook, or just Python files, like Sphinx Gallery or something helps with that. Um, then writing a readme with a quick start guide, uh, which would include installation instructions, uh, and then make sure that your code has auto-generated documentation. That just saves you time. Um, and we use uh, Sphinx a lot for Python. Um, R Oxygen is also used uh, for R. Finally, code should be modifiable. So these, there's a number of style guidelines that you can use. Uh, we use PEP8 a lot for our Python code. Uh, there's also auto formatters that help. Uh, we personally use black, but there's plenty of auto formatters that you can use. Uh, you should have uh, the ability for other people to have add bug reports um, or other feature additions or documentation fixes. Uh, they should be able to do pull requests and feature additions, like I mentioned. And these can really be done easily through uh, GitHub. Uh, importantly, you want to have unit tests for each function. So uh, PyTest is what we use a lot for Python. Um, and these are extremely important. They ensure reliability so that in, when you modify your code, you don't break something. Uh, and then continuous inter integration is also very important. So uh, our lab uses uh, Circle CI right now. We used to use Travis CI. Um, these enable these can be built on pull requests. And so you can see uh, whether or not your code is breaking anything uh, unexpectedly or not. And then finally, uh, we have a number of badges that we have included. Uh, these badges are great indicators to potential users that you follow best practices as well as uh, what the current status is of your package, whether it's reliable in its current state or not. Uh, so coverage uh, is important. Code quality, uh, documentate, link to, to documentation is important. Obviously, people are going to want to see that. Uh, the latest version, the license, of course, a DOI maybe for like a paper or another identifier. Uh, build status. 
uh, whether or not your code is currently compiling correctly, total number of downloads, that one is hit or miss because at least a few downloads can be misleading um, the downloads batch in particular. Uh, and then finally, benchmarks. So great, your code runs and it meets the standards. Uh, how does it compare to other algorithms? Well, uh, we want to give reason we want to give users a reason to actually use our code. So that's why benchmarks are there. Um, so these can be done, again, in Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, Gigantum as another plug for that. Um, so our personal lab software goals are to develop and maintain our own packages, uh, which I'll list a few that we have. Uh, and then more importantly, I think we're trying to PR some of our algorithms that we've created uh, into some upstream packages like SciPy or Scikit-Learn. Uh, and these are important because, I mean, it's when you're creating a package, it's really hard to market it, especially in open source. And you want as many users to use your al uh, algorithms as possible. So when you PR to upstream packages, you have that. And you also have the reliability that a lot of these big packages have um, because they've spent years and years of their time ensuring that everything builds correctly. Uh, so, for example, SciPy, I think Scikit-Learn are two great examples of that. Um, so, these are some of the tools that we've created. These are our packages. A lot, of, some of these algorithms are in, uh, like I mentioned before, upstream. Uh, but these are the ones. Hippo is actually the one that I created. Um, and that's the one that I've done most of my work, uh, my current PhD work in. So this is our lab. So great, thank you, Sandy. So I guess we can now like open the stage for questions. As I said before, we have some of them prepared. But uh, we also welcome questions from the audience. So if you have something that you want to ask our panel, then you can use the section of Q&A to do so. So there is one question I had um, in mind um, that I think many of you uh, like already covered in your presentations. So that would be, how would you describe the influence of open source software development contribution has on academic career projects? So does any one of you want to discuss it first? I think Hao mentioned it in her talk. Right? Yes, um, I would still say that's something I'm still trying to figure out because as you see, I'm still just a postdoc and on my CV, there's nothing other than my GitHub contributions like, to indicate that I am capable of doing software engineering. And, and I have to be very honest with my job search inside academia, marketing that part is, is not always successful. And I'm, but I do feel there's a lot more labs. They are openly talking about, oh, we want this type of people. It, it's just, well, because I was trying to look inside UK and that was a little bit limited. So I ended up going to, I need to move to a different country in order to get that experience. Yeah. But I don't know if like uh, Adina or Caleb, you have some personal insight onto this. Yeah. Um, I can say something unless Caleb, you may, if you want to go first, please, please go first. Um, if not, then I'll just start. So I have, I have mixed, mixed feelings about this. I see that there is positive development and that makes me happy because I feel, and David has also posted that in the chat that there is a, growing awareness of research software engineering and there are dedicated positions that are created for this and in the end it's also a transferable skill i think that people who do this in science are valued but they are underappreciated academically so there's still plenty of room for improvement it's in some cases still considered like an overpaid technician role instead of a proper academic role when research software is really the fundamental basis that our science depends on and open source is in my opinion the sustainable uh, and 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 only durable um, and accessible way to 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 create science so I really want to see more funding, more appreciation, more academic credit, like 
it's great to see the general of open source software. It's it's completely for our so like that they don't play the impact factor game. Um, but but I think there's still so much room for improvement. I totally agree. Uh, there's still so much room for improvement, and I think uh, at the moment there's no direct benefit. But I would say these indirect benefits uh, uh, because especially seeing the push from. Uh, publishers and also from funders and so in as much as and you can see most funders are actually now looking at people who are actually contributing openly and so indirectly that would increase your chances for getting funding which would ultimately maybe increase your publications which is what is a traditional measure of uh, scientific output so indirectly I would say uh, there is but I would say there's still so much that needs, still needs to be done, especially in the change of culture and incentives. Yeah, I also I also agree. Um, I think that there's been a push recently for making code um, op open access, not even even if it's not a contribution to let's say a formal open source package, but at the minimum, making code open access. Uh, enables reproducibility because that's really a big problem in a number of fields if you've ever tried to take a paper and just reproduce the experiment exactly based on what they wrote in the paper most of the time you're going to get completely different results and that's sad uh, so i think having uh at least at least from my work i do a lot of computational work so having that open access um, is is important. It also gives you um, gives your research, I think, more reliability in itself because people uh, can see what you did and uh, they can ask questions further based on how weird things that they see. Definitely, I agree with all of you, and all of you also mentioned there are many things that we can still do, right? So do we have any specific examples of the things that we could uh, do right now, even if they are like very um, idealistic uh, at the moment and not feasible, but do you have ideas of what we could do right now uh, to achieve this aim of um, not being heard in our academic careers because we want to um, develop open source software packages with our research? Uh, I can start with this one. Uh, I think it really starts from the top, right? So we need more funding agencies, funding research into open source software and open source development of software, of tools. Uh, and it's, it's difficult, I think, to convince lawmakers or whoever the decision makers are who do that to, to do so. Uh, but I think that until that really happens, uh, we're going to kind of be in a little state of limbo on um, on how far we can really get with open source development. I would also wish to to to, to add to what what Zambit has said for a different type of funding model, because the way that scientific funding traditionally works is not tuned to how sustainable open source development um, works. So um, if funding is uh, only awarded to, let's say, um, novelty projects where people just promise to reinvent the wheel instead of contributing to established open source tools where where like uh, like summit i think said what what yeah uh, help to 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 get this this code used and and maintained and and usable for most most people um and also um having having the ability because scientific funding is usually project based super short term and scientific projects when they start from the beginning, they take time. It takes years to grow an open source project into something that is sustainable, that has a huge user base. And I think there is something in it that scientific funders can definitely consider because um, open source makes a, a, a software project incredibly um, 
too durable compared to typically to typical scientific projects. If your funding runs out for your experiment, the experiment is is ended. There's no way to continue this work. If you have an open source community and you have maintainers, contributors from all over the place, then your uh, your project isn't dependent on the short-term funding and it can sustain even if the traditional funding sources run out. But that I think needs a network of, of software, research software engineers, um, networking to, to connect, to train and, and funding models that acknowledge that this type of work is valuable um, for academia and that, that the funding that adapts to the needs of research software. Yeah, um, I might have something to add here. Um, so I, I try to communicate that with um, PIs I have worked with about like what is the potential uh, contribution of um, open source software to their project. Because uh, uh, most of the PIs now, they come from a place where they write scientific ideas into grants. So um, sometimes it, you just I might want to because we are, we're not going to change the funding model just over time, like o overnight. We, it's going to happen throughout a period of time. So what I'm thinking most of the time is to get their creative ideas to package like a, some kinds of open source contribution with a scientific question. <laughs> so you just slot in something and like slot in one sentence, we're going to hire someone to write code and hopefully that it was a consistent strand that will make this kind of um, things in the budget of your funding more regularly and if more funders see this maybe they'll say oh this is a new kind of role people keep requesting maybe we should change our model a little bit it's like that's the one thing that i've seen that has worked so far within the current system yeah i totally agree Al. uh and i think it's all about creating that critical mass uh when we have more people especially you'd say uh, uh pis writing grant applications with uh software developers included in the current application so when you have uh more people contributing to software and actually uh, pushing that as an actually real contribution to science, uh, then when we have that critical mass, then we can be able to change the status quo. And to be able to achieve that critical mass, then it takes uh, that need for just building awareness, not just within your own peers, but also uh, with the PIs. They're the ones who are decision makers. They can influence the funding models. They can influence incentives. So working with your peers, uh, training them, but also building awareness and sensitizing your seniors so that they can be able to push for it and they are the best people who are best placed they sit in the funding agencies they sit in uh they are the editors and so they are the people who can actually push for this uh so that's uh that's that those are my thoughts i love this critical critical mass thing because it leads me to my next question perfectly and it is how can we encourage that more people actually use and contribute. They are two separate questions, right? But how can we encourage more use? Yeah, that people use more and contribute more to open source software in our field. Um, to me, the fundamental um, way to improve it is is training, and that connects a lot to what Caleb has has presented in his presentation, which I find, found really, really inspiring. Um, because in my opinion, a lack of adoption is usually um, founded in, in a lack of opportunities or in a lack of knowledge. Like I, when I encountered this MATLAB toolbox, I could have been unlucky and been in a lab where MATLAB is the standard language to use. And then that would have been my destiny. And I know too many PhD students that, that don't, that, that don't know enough, that didn't have the, the opportunities to learn uh, or to be guided or to have the space, the freedom to, to explore these things. And if we start with training, then I think we can go a long way. And what I find really troubling is when universities or states make contracts with 
corporations that enforce, for example, the use of closed source languages uh, or operating systems, anything closed source in curricula, because um, that's creating the inaccessibility and this, this gap in learning opportunities from the very start. Yeah. I totally uh, agree and training is one aspect to to achieve that and I think the other aspect is of course a change of changing the culture and practice uh, that are actually the status quo which is always it's really hard to change the status quo and uh, one way to change that is by showing uh, show don't tell being able to demonstrate the benefit demonstrate uh, the use and then facilitate the adoption of such practices so create a pathway towards uh, towards that by uh, showing the benefit to them uh, to us and to the scientific community and then creating a pathway that eases the adoption of these practices and uh, i believe that's how we can uh, change the culture and just uh, increase the adoption So, oh, yeah, you can go. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think it's also, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's both, both, it's not only, um, I guess, on other researchers to adopt open source tools, but it's on us maintainers to make it easy to use. And I think that's a big challenge with a lot of open source tools is if you've tried to look through their documentation, it's hard to figure out what's, what it's doing uh, and how to use it. And I think that if we, from our side, uh, make it a lot simpler, uh, like I mentioned in, in my introduction, a one line install instruction, fairly good documentation, emphasis on tutorials, uh, then I think that bridges the gap a little bit uh, when it comes to um, using or developing and developing these tools. Yeah, I definitely agree with Sambit's point because uh, one of the very interesting situation, at least in FMI analysis software, is we have a lot of software that was like, started building in the 90s and they are open sourced in principle. But um, the, and they are really, really powerful tools, but not always the most uh, user-friendly things to do. Because a lot of scientists, they maybe they have the skill to write their algorithm into code, but um, software developing practice is not something that they are aware of. And is I, I personally was not aware of it until probably like a, like a year or something into my PhD. And simply because I was chatting with like, a friend who do computer science like and software development as a living, th that was the point I realized, oh, making it usable for other people is important. And a lot of scientific software doesn't come from that angle. Uh, so that will go back to Adina and Caleb's point about the whole education of how do we train up people to do software like, in the scientific community. And yeah, and that's something we can all work together, I think, as maintainers or as users, just raise awareness and yeah, help people around you. That's what I would say. Uh, just another point kind of on, on top of that. Uh, it's, I think, especially when it comes to PRing into larger packages, uh, they've existed for a very large, long time. And their user base, or their code base, I mean, is very large. And it's very intimidating uh, when you try to see how I can change this or how I can make a major feature addition. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the solution is on how to make it less intimidating because I think it, it always will be. Uh, it's something that you just kind of learn from when you do it the first time. But I know that when I was when I made my contribution to SciPy, uh, I had to modify my code a lot. Uh, and it was the same language, but the way I wrote it and the way they do things, they're completely different. And I think that 
Um, that's one aspect of why contribution is difficult. Uh, I'm not sure if you all think there's an easier, easy solution for that, but just my thoughts. I would, I would maybe, maybe respond to that. Um, because I think it's uh, absolutely impressive to do major feature um, implementations and contribute them to, to an existing large open source library. Um, I think one way to get people started is maybe not with such a major feature, but um, many projects I'm aware of create low barriers of entry in order to build a community that um, that can contribute and um, things as um, I don't want to be rude at like low level, but I don't mean this in a bad way um, as uh, enhancing uh, style things in the documentation, helping others in uh, community forums. All of this, all of these are contributions to to open source, in my opinion. And once you get a hang into the community then you'll grow with the tasks that you seek for yourself and every contribution small or, or, or little is is really valuable and in, in in my experience at least very very valued by the people that receive it and uh, if we can have that consistently in in our fields then i think that can already go a long way but certainly very very impressive and very very difficult to to do like major major features and to adhere to the style guide to the way that existing code is written yeah totally and maybe a related question to all these two is like how can we make sure that our users and our contributors or even the, the developers of a software actually come from like a diverse community and we have many different opinions, backgrounds, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's a really tough question to answer, but um, I happened to be at a code sprint just a few months ago and um, they especially isolate that part out too talk about how do they get people and I think some of the answer has been touched upon by Adina about like contributing from a documentation like stance because at the end of the day these things are being used by people and and so you want to make sure there's different levels of contributions users can make to entry from a diverse like point of skill so people maybe they they feel oh there's a the documentation doesn't read so right maybe i can help with that and there are sometimes it's just like pure like style related website maybe they have nothing uh, no experience with the algorithm itself but maybe they can make the documentation even just like the update these things template to a more modern one that's a big one oh, actually that's a really big contribution yeah <laughs> um, yeah and sometimes you, you can have like really small bug fix like for algorithm that's basically where i started for most of my contributions it's like very very small and that is related to my uh tech uh, well my a uh, research specialty background that the software maintainer might not have um so yeah i think one part is to as a maintainer is you want to um, break down all the issues you have existing in them, um, help people get rid be, be, being this uh, being a place that you're ready to help people, like as the default. So yeah, I think I, I think what uh, what other people mentioned also in the chat about the good first issue label. That's that's a really good point. Uh, there's you can advertise those. I think I don't remember what the two packages were that I stuff in but uh they're they're also really good i think there's been a push recently though uh with accessibility um in a lot of these major websites and i think uh there's uh i think having basically documentation themes that are accessible uh that have a lot of those requirements are important and it should enable 
uh, a far more diverse community of, of maintainers and contributors. I really do agree. Like, I think it's all about those small, creating those small mountains or small hills for uh, those who want to climb the mountains to start with. Uh, so when you are mapping your trails, you can't just map all trails being Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa or the Everest, but if there are some small hills or even some flat crowns, as you say, just documentation, small uh, fixes, uh, just leaving those ones for, for others. So, and then uh, the aspect of trail mapping, documentation, uh, documenting in such a way that it's easy for others to follow, being a trail mapper in this case. So just, and then when someone decides to come for the hike, then make sure you hold their hand, encourage them and assist them in those small hills and just help them towards the hill where they can next time be the trail mappers, next time be the ones to assist someone else take up their next hike. So I think really the analogy of hiking and trail mapping uh, works really well and just being an ally when it comes to uh, supporting them to make their contribution. Yeah, that was absolutely beautiful. I feel bad <laughs> adding, trying to add something now because that would be such a nice closing statement. So just all remember what what Caleb said <laughs> uh, um, after after I finish talking. Because um, the only thing that I can add to to those great points is that uh, related to the fields of of neuroscience and 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 biology or bioinformatics. The um, place where I've seen such interactions, those small hills being created, the people uh, helping others, um, those 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 kinds of events, they were the the hackathons that the field um, has adopted for the past decade. Um, be that be that brain hacks. I think the bioinformatics community has a really really strong hackathon open source culture, um, and those were also the things that sparked interest and 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 confidence in me uh so that i i think is also a, a way in which our field um tries to to make our contributor base more diverse but obviously there's still so much more work to do awesome yeah i agree so we are um getting close to uh, the end of our session, but we wanted uh, to give you uh, like an opportunity to maybe say one minute of something that you may want to add as, as parting thoughts. So does anyone want like to add something that maybe we haven't talked about? There is also a small time for questions from the audience if someone wants to ask something. I certainly want to at least use the, the opportunity for a short shout out. Like there are so many, so many cool things to highlight, but but one thing that I think is very much worth highlighting is the, the work that the that the touring way has been doing because they created uh, this uh, community handbook where they documented everything open science, open source, and also created a space where people have the guidance to engage in their first contributions. Um, and I think that is uh, something that that I find worth like highlighting in, in this session. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to give a shameless plug to uh, our tools uh, in our lab. Uh, so we have a number of tools uh, that to do statistical learning, like hypothesis testing, graph statistics, um, different classifiers, transfer learning algorithms, and then also visualization algorithms and neuron tracing algorithms. There's like a whole bunch of things. Uh, so if you if you want to use those potentially, you can see. Uh, the Neurodata organization on GitHub um, has all of these packages. Uh, and then our website's neurodata.io, uh, if you're ever interested.
how can can I have any party thoughts? Uh, so first, uh, thanks to the organizers for the really amazing uh, uh, just conversation that we've had, and of course the Malvika and the Open Life Sciences. Actually, I think they are doing a lot of uh, uh, trail mapping and holding people's hands to just ensure that they can also join the open science and open source movement. So I want to uh, shout out to them. And then the other thing is just the aspect that contributing to open source, just using open source is actually contributing to open source. Uh, it's not about getting to write code, but the use of open source, asking questions and then suggesting features that is contributing to open source. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I I just feel I'm overwhelmed by like the amazing panels like here with me because yeah, I I am very new to this whole journey of like contributing to open source and um, I really learn a lot from all of you and and I want to give shout out to Adina's like Data Lab Hamburg project because I have it's, honestly it's like it is a lifesaver for me. And I have literally followed the handbook and created a small like, helper like scripts, and and I overpackaged it into like a small like repo installable, and all that to help my day to day work. And yeah, it is really really great to see like different kinds of projects and 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 how Caleb is like using this like trail making like, analogy every little bit. That's awesome. I love finishing, actually, this is a great idea, finishing panels with shout outs to other projects. This is a great idea. Um, but I also I want to thank you all a lot for coming here and, and talking with us. And I encourage everyone in the audience, if you have more questions for, for any of the members of our panel today, uh, Malvika has been sharing their personal websites and uh, their bios and how you can get in touch with them. So do so. Uh, yeah, thank you again so much for 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 coming and discussing these things.